Thank you all so much for coming. I've spent the last hour trying to get this PowerPoint on this screen, and it's finally there. So forgive me for being out of breath and a bit sweaty. Um, apparently, this is the first event we've had here since the Thouro began. We were going to do this earlier, and right as we were getting ready to do it, uh, the protest broke out. And we almost had to cancel again tonight because the continuing protest. So I was thinking we should just keep pro prolonging it and every, you know, every few weeks schedule it and see if it, there's a connection that helps the, helps the protest break out even more. I'm not sure. But we're going to do it tonight. This is my book. It's called The Palestinian Idea, Film, Media, and the Radical Imagination. Basically, tonight, in the next 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to try to do three things. One, I'm going to explain to you why I wrote this book, how I came to this subject. The second thing I want to do is kind of give you an overview of the book. What are the central arguments? I'm going to give you my own Cliff Notes version of the book, the three major arguments. If you never read the book, you'll still understand it. And then I'm going to give a very, very condensed version of my favorite chapter, which is the chapter about black Palestinian solidarity. Now, I've presented this work to many different academic audiences before, particularly American audiences. I'm a bit nervous presenting it here just because it's a different audience, a very, uh, an audience that knows more than me about Palestine. But I think what I can present is a, a way of thinking about Palestine, a way of thinking about race, that it could be helpful, could be useful, or not. But I look forward to seeing what you think about it. So if you, if you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm not from here. I'm from a small town called Texarkana, Texas. And um, when I grew up, I grew up in a part of the country where I was surrounded by the, the ghost of Jim Crow, right? The ghost of uh, uh, American apartheid. As a kid, I used to look at pictures like this. Now, of course, this was before I was born. But I used to look at pictures like this and just wonder in awe, like, how this kind of hate could be so rampant in my own country. How is it that these people could be so open about their hatred and about their racism? Um, I would look at pictures like this. This is Little Rock um, in the 1950s, not very far from my hometown. And I wondered, what happened to these white people, the mob behind her? They could be the people I grew up with. They could be my school teacher, the people I went to church with, my own parents. And I used to wonder, like, what would I have done if I had been old enough to be in that situation. It wasn't just faraway cities like Little Rock, or not that far away. It was even my hometown, Texarkana. This is a picture from 1959, I believe, when two teenagers attempted to be the first black students to integrate and go to school at the local community college. They were met by the mob. My dad grew up really close to this college, and he remembered, even as a kid, seeing pictures of a noose, or seeing, it, seeing it himself. And I found the pictures of the noose that was hung at this demonstration. Um, and the, the, the two students only stayed for a few minutes. They got in the black cab because even the taxis were segregated at this point, and they fled the scene. Texas County Community College was not desegregated for another 10 years. So I used to look at pictures like this, and I was such a naive white kid in Texas. I used to remember, I thought to myself, well, I don't know what I would have done in that situation. I hope I would have had the courage to stand for justice and against racism. But I'll never have to challenge myself because all those struggles are over. It's in the past. That was what my naive, naive Texas mindset told me. Obviously, that's not the case, neither there nor here. When I look at pictures like this, I can't help but see it through the lens of my childhood and my early fascination with the pictures of Jim Crow. Um, as you, you're all well aware, this is a picture of a Palestinian who's been basically kicked out of her apartment. Uh, this is a very regular occurrence, which somebody might even just go to the grocery store. And when they return, a room, a floor, an entire apartment could have been taken over by settlers, perhaps recently arrived from Brooklyn. And when I see these pictures, to me, I can't help but see the same white supremacist apartheid mentality that surrounded my own hometown. I begin my book with Hebron, the largest city in the West Bank. Something like 300,000 Palestinian residents. Does it sound OK? Is it a bit of a buzz? I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, Hebron has about 300,000 Palestinian residents and a small population of maybe 2,000 Jewish settlers who have arrived in the last 15 years. What's really unique about Hebron is in most places, the settlers arrive on the outskirts of the city, in the valleys, or actually above the valleys, but they arrive on the outskirts of the city and gradually take over the farmlands. But in Hebron, there is a settlement inside the middle of the old city itself. It started in 1968 a group of Jewish settlers arrived in Hebron and, and they disguised themselves as Swiss tourists and they checked out a room in a hotel and then they just refused to leave. And that became eventually the settlement that we still have today in Hebron. Um, it's a particularly violent community. Um, different, you know, it, 
the, the occupation has different faces in different places. Some places, the face is much friendlier. They try to put on a multicultural facade. But other places, the face is quite violent. I think Hebron is one of the more violent places in the, in the West Bank. This is the face of Baruch Goldstein. In 1994, this Brooklyn-born physician, a doctor, walked into the central mosque of Hebron with a, a, a machine gun, and he just unloaded on the worshipers. It was during Ramadan, and it was Friday morning prayers. He killed um, 29 people, a wounded 125, and the only reason he was, he, the only reason he stopped is because he had to reload his weapon. While he was putting a new uh, magazine into his, his weapon, some people inside the mosque managed to hit him over the head with a, with a fire extinguisher and put it, put it into his rampage. The nearby settlement has turned him into a martyr. This is actually his uh, picture of his uh, tomb. Uh, it, it, written in Hebrew, on top of it, it says, <clears throat> he gave his soul for the sake of the people of Israel, the Torah, and the land. His hands are clean and his heart good. There's even a road named after him in the settlement. So Hebron is a particularly ugly place. And in response to this act of terrorism, what was Israel's you know, what was Israel's actions? Well, it was actually to make conditions worse. They took downtown Hebron, the main downtown thoroughfare, and turned it into a virtual ghost town. A uh, partition was, was erected, and one side was reserved for Jews, one side, a much smaller side, for Palestinians. Any Palestinians who happened to have their homes or their shops on this street, they were out of luck. Their doors were barred shut, their windows were closed. Uh, many had to move. So the, ironically, the response of Israel to apartheid violence was to increase the system of apartheid. I begin with this particular place because it's such an ugly story. And yet even in such a desperate, ugly place, I think we can still see at least fragments of liberation and freedom or even utopia. In 2013, when Barack Obama was paying his one and only presidential visit to Israel, a group of protesters in Hebron decided to desegregate the segregated streets. They put on masks of Martin Luther King. They carried portraits of Rosa Parks. They had Palestinian flags, um, T-shirts with civil rights um, slogans. And they even played music from the civil rights, uh, We Shall Overcome, right? these kinds of songs. And then they desegregated the segregated streets of, of Hebron. It didn't last very long, as you can imagine. Within, within minutes, they were arrested by uh, soldiers. And even some Jewish settlers, like this American uh, named David Wilder, decided to go into the streets and tear the banners from their hands. Um, even though this protest only lasted a few minutes, um, pictures of it spread across the internet and social media. And when I see pictures like this of a guy in a mask getting arrested, it's almost as if Martin Luther King was resurrected just to be arrested yet again. And, you know, nice coincidence, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day, so it's, it's nice that we're talking about this now. So I begin with this particular antidote, because I think it really encapsulates all the themes of my book. And I'm going to explain what those are now. So my book is called The Palestinian Idea, Film, Media, and the Radical Imagination. And let me just begin with the cover. If you go to the bookstore and you look at books about Palestine, you don't usually see covers like this. Right? You, you, what do you usually see? Bombs barbed wire, walls, symbols of apartheid, symbols of oppression, death, and maybe hopelessness. And those are all real realities. I am not ex at all trying to downplay the severity of the situation or turn my, my, my eyes away from it. But I don't think that's all that Palestine is. At Palestine, as my book is really, really trying to show, is it's also a story of Zionism's failures. Zionism's failures to fully colonize the Palestinian land, the Palestinian people, or the Palestinian imagination. So I have three central arguments, um, and I'm going to explain them now. The first one seems very, very simple, but it's really, it's, it's, it's really the backbone of my entire book, and that's just a simple, simple argument, that equality exists. Well, what do I mean by that? That seems a bit strange. Equality exists. Okay, white guy, talking about equality in the midst of apartheid. And yet, I think it does exist. Now, let me back up a little bit. Edward Said, from some of his earliest writings to some of his latest writings, a four or five decade span, time span, would occasionally use this phrase, the Palestinian idea. That's what my book is named after. And when he talked about the Palestinian idea, he had this beautiful, democratic, harmonious vision for peaceful relations 
and harmonious coexistence for all of Palestinian, all of Palestine's peoples, Arabs, Jews, Muslims, Christians, men, women. It was always located in the future. And, you know, my idea is we can dream all we want about the future, but if the seeds of that future don't already exist somewhere in the present, then it's just a fairy tale. Whatever revolutionary hopes and dreams we have, we have to find ways that they're already located all around us. Like C.L.R. James, a great uh, Trinidadian communist, made this argument about the factory floor. He said, we want communism, and we can already find traces of communism in the basic human relations already taking place in the factory floor. I think the same goes for Palestine. We can see an ideal we want, this equality in the future, but in what ways can we already find it existing in the present? So when I turn to a, a protest like this, I have a different interpretation that you might initially expect. This is not a protest, well, it is. It, it is a protest of people fighting for equality in the future, but it's not only that. This is also a demonstration of equality in the present. These people aren't saying we are unequal and therefore we are fighting. They're saying, no, we are equal. We are free. And because of that, we are going to fight, to fight the injustice all around us. There is a presupposition of equality, a presupposition of freedom that is generating the protest. The people protesting are not unequal, they are equal. They are already in a sense, at least internally, free. And that is what motivates them to continue fighting against all odds. So this is, this is what I mean when I say equality exists. It's, a, it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about revolution and thinking about radical action. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail now, but in addition to Edward Said, when I'm thinking about equality in the present, I'm drawing on Jacques Ranciere, a French theorist who's still alive, and my old mentor, Cedric Robinson, who wrote a book called Black Marxism, which has been translated into Arabic. Um, he wrote about the black radical tradition and the ways that freedom already existed before slavery. Um, this idea of equality already existing is encapsulated by this, in this quote by Said. We have been uninvited guests for too long. Lingering outside the main march of humanity must not become a habit. Nobody will ask you in, you must march in, believing yourself to be equal to the occasion and suitable for the feast. So as you can see here, he's talking about equality as something you presuppose, something you perform, not something that's you know, held off to some distant, far off future that will never arrive. So that's my basic, basic argument. It exists in other parts of cultural theory, but I haven't seen it fully articulated in Palestine. My second argument um, is about culture. If, if equality exists, where do we see it? I say we see it in culture itself. Culture can be more political than politics itself. Now in this, you know, this academic world where I come from, a cultural theory, this is not necessarily a very novel argument, but I think in certain hyper-political places, it is a novel argument. We're used to thinking about politics as the barricades, or the negotiation table, or treaties, or wars, and that's all good or bad, but I don't think that's where true emancipatory visions come from. Here I'm reminded of my friend and unfortunately former colleague, Stephen Salida, who said that true liberation has never occurred through the legislative maneuvers of civilized men in designer suits. When I made this, I should have put a picture of him without a suit on. It kind of negates the, the argument. But the idea is, if we want to think about radical emancipatory politics, we don't only look at what the president, look at Lebanon. You don't only look at what the politicians are saying. You look at the street. You look at poetry, graffiti, film, music. Right? And that's what my book is, so especially about film. It's looking at culture as a place where politics can be really radical. And it is precisely those radical elements of culture that can influence the more traditional sites of politics. So if equality exists, as I am saying it does, we find it in culture. The third and final argument is that black Palestinian solidarity also has ramifications for our use of theory. So the last few years, I've been really obsessed by black Palestinian solidarity. As I said earlier, I grew up with the ghost of Jim Crow. So when I see Malcolm X or Angela Davis or uh, Martin Luther King being used by Palestinians, or when I see people in the United States fighting white supremacy, holding up Palestinian flags, it brings the joy to my heart. It's something I'm very, very interested in. I'm not the only one interested in it. In the last few years, there's been several books written about black Palestinian solidarity. These are four of them. Alex Lubin, who used to live here, Keith Feldman, Angela Davis, uh, Michael Fishbach. They've all written these books recently about black Palestinian solidarity. Now, the only thing I would say about these books is they're very empirical. They're documenting a history that a lot of us don't know about. The beginnings of black Palestinian solidarity in the 50s all the way up to the present, all the YouTube videos, all the hip-hop songs, all the delegations. 
Now, my book doesn't do that except for chapter six, the one I'm going to talk about now. Chapter six does look at it, but the rest of the book doesn't look at black Palestinian solidarity. But what it does is I'm attempting to enact black Palestinian solidarity by taking black radical voices and putting them in conversation with Palestinian film and culture. What does Palestinian cinema look like if we watch it through the lens of the Black Panther Party? Right? What, what do Palestinian films look like if we examine them with the ideas of Cedric Robinson or Angela Davis or Asada Shakur? So even though, my, even though only, one chapter, only one chapter of my book is explicitly about Black Palestinian solidarity, Black Palestinian solidarity pervades the entire thing at the level of theory, epistemology. So in the time that remains, well, I'm, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the book chapters so you don't have to read it. And then I'm gonna give you a very, very condensed version of chapter six. Um, chapter one is basically my theoretical introduction, kind of what I just gave you. Chapters two and three were supposed to be one chapter, but it was too long, so I made it two chapters. But it's, 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 it's uh, the question of identity, like what is a Palestinian? What is Palestinian identity? Where does it come from? And I think about that in relation to Palestinian film, and particularly the movies of Anne-Marie Jasser, Salt of the Sea and When I Saw You. Um, then I go to chapter four, Hollow Time, a film that showed here a few years ago, uh, My Love Awaits Me by the Sea. That's also the cover um, of my book. It's uh, a Palestinian jumping into the sea in Akka, which is uh, a clip from her film, My Love Awaits Me by the Sea. In chapter four, I, I'm curious about time because we think, all, we think a lot about how Zionism colonizes Palestinian land, but in what ways does Zionism colonize Palestinian time? Um, I won't go into it now, but I talk about ways, not only that Palestinian time is colonized, but ways that Palestinians can break out of that colonized time. And I look at the documentary, My Love Waits Me Out of the Sea. Chapter five is my critique of Foucault, essentially, but it's trying to think about Palestinian visibility and the surveillance of Palestinian bodies and how it's related to questions of power and resistance and do these generate each other or are there ways to break out of the cycle? And I look at the movie Paradise now. And finally, chapter six, Palestine in black and white. I don't really look at film in this chapter. I look at different cultural things like YouTube videos, um, uh, protest spectacles, and I think about global solidarity. So you see all these chapters have very, very different subjects. One's about Palestinian identity, One's about uh, time, one's about surveillance and resistance, one's about global solidarity. And they all have different media objects, but at the, the basis of all of them are those three arguments already laid out. You know, one, if equality exists, how do we make sense of Palestinian identity? If equality exists, how do we make sense of Palestinian time? How do we make sense of global solidarity? So they're all linked by the same arguments. All right, um, so from here I'd like to I would like to br very, very briefly, I'm going to limit myself to 15 minutes, give you an introduction to chapter six. It's my favorite chapter. And what I always tell the people is if you decide to read my book, Shukran, thank you very much. If you get bored, just skip to chapter six. Because I think chapter six is the most exciting chapter. And I would like you people to read it. I'm afraid people will read the first two chapters and stop and never finish. All right. So let me take you back a few years. Summer of 2014, it was the summer of hell for people in Gaza. You'll remember that um, that summer, for a period of 51 days, 20,000 tons of explosives were dropped on the, dropped on the strip, um, the equivalent of six nuclear bombs. 2,000 were killed, 10,000 wounded, and a quarter million displaced. This was, to quote Israeli strategists, just another example of Israel mowing the grass. At a time that Palestinian lives were being destroyed in Gaza, the United States was engaged in two very, very different media campaigns. Let's see if you recognize them. Anybody recognize this? Did, I, did anybody do this? Anybody? Come on, admit it. I'm some, some of you, oh, maybe not. Whenever I present this in America, everybody's hands go up because this was such a popular thing. It went viral. The idea was to raise money for ALS Association. Um, and there was this weird challenge, which to this day I don't quite understand, which you dump ice on your head and dare your friends to do the same and they're supposed to donate money to the ALS Association. But at the precise same time that these people were dumping ice on their heads, there was another social media campaign taking place in the United States. And that was hands up, don't shoot. After Michael Brown was slain on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri by a white cop, people across the nation, particularly Ferguson, but from California to New York, 
were taking the streets, taking selfies, demonstrating against white supremacy in the, in the US justice and legal system. Now these two campaigns couldn't be more different. Even though they took place at the same time, there's a very, very different politics motivating both of them. The first one, the ice bucket challenge, I'm sure it did, did wonders for people with ALS, but it's not a radical protest. If anything, it's just philanthropy. It very, very much fit the, the bread and butter ideology of neoliberalism. And for that reason, even you know, our political and technocratic elites felt free to take part in it. I'm gonna show you this picture and take a second and enjoy it because this is as close as you will ever get to seeing the president who instituted waterboarding having the tables turned on him, right? But this is, this is true. Like, he even felt free to take part in the ice bucket challenge. It wasn't radical at all. It was just a, a money raising thing. Hands up, don't shoot, on the other hand, was, was far different. You didn't see George Bush doing this. You didn't see Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates doing this. Um, you saw black students at Howard University doing this. Because to take a stand against entrenched white supremacy is to take a very, very radical stand indeed. Now what's interesting, one of the interesting things is how both of these campaigns managed to break outside of the US nation state and even came to the Levant. As far as I can tell, the first Israeli politician to take part in the ice bucket challenge was this guy. He was a Knesset member, Israeli, the Israeli parliament. Um, his name is Dove Lipman. And he, he spoke to the camera in English which is significant. He speaks Hebrew, but he spoke English, and he took part in the ice bucket challenge and dared his colleagues to do the same. Pretty soon, it started to take off across Israel, and then some Israelis started to adapt it to their own ends. Now remember, this is the summer of 2014, the precise same time that Gaza is in, under, under fire. And I just lost the video. Oh, I need the mouse. Let me show you a video from this time. <clears throat> Hopefully the sound works. No, it doesn't. That's okay. I'll explain to you what it is. These are Israeli soldiers, and they address the camera in English, and they dare people to do the Hamas versus Homos, or as they say, Homos challenge, right? Um, the idea is Hamas is a terrorist organization, but homos is delicious. And so they take a bunch of homos, as you'll see, and they begin spreading it on their face. And then they dare their friends to do the same or to donate money to the Israeli Defense Forces. All right. And they, they're all laughing about it. Um, okay. Now, this video didn't go viral in the same way that uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge did. But it did have a handful of imitators. And if you go on to YouTube today and search for Hamas versus Homeless Challenge, you'll find people who took part in it. So, it, so uh, Israelis are using the Ice Bucket Challenge as a, a model to raise money for IDF precisely at a time that they're obliterating the Gaza Strip. Palestinians, on the other hand, went a different direction. They, many Palestinians decided to uh, show their support for the protesters in Ferguson, Missouri. Here's a Palestinian holding up a sign. The Palestinian people know what it means to be shot while unarmed because of your ethnicity. Another one quoted King. Palestinians support Ferguson because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Martin Luther King. Other Palestinians decided to use Twitter to give directions about how to deal with the pepper spray and the tear gas. No doubt coming from experience. Spray alcohol-based perfume on a scarf, wrap around a face. Smell helps counteract tear gas. Scarf protects identity. If you didn't know that, you might be able to use it tonight. Now, when I talk about black Palestinian solidarity, some people uh, are, give me a kind of a confused look. It doesn't seem that natural to them. It's not something they've heard of. If I talk about U.S.-Israeli solidarity, nobody bats an eye. We're used to thinking about that. But my question is, if the elites of the United States and Israeli governments can find, um, you know, mutual reasons to support each other, why not the people living under them? Why not the oppressed communities that exist underneath the Iron Hill of U.S. and Israeli domination. So, you know, US, <clears throat> the black Palestinian solidarity is not, not anything new. Um, if we go back to the early 20th century, a lot of black leaders were Zionist in their orientation. Uh, Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, um, Paul Robeson, that one breaks my heart, Martin Luther King, 
they all, to different degrees, modeled themselves after Zionists. They voiced support for Israel. But gradually, as there became a much more consciousness that Zionism is not just a liberatory idea for Jews, but actually a colonialist mission, um, you, you begin to see a serious turn in black thought, sp sp begin, beginning specifically with Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. Um, I'm going to skip through a little bit because I want to get to some of the juicier things. But, you know, I kind of, in my chapter, I talk about the history of blacks, Palestinian solidarity. Here's a Martin Luther King's organization in 1979 here in Beirut. They came and they linked arms with Yasser Arafat and saying, we shall overcome. And um, I look at different ways it takes place today. People like Danny Glover, different hip hop artists, different news spectacles, people like Angela Davis who continue. Um, I'm uh, rushing through this. It's in the book. I do want to briefly mention these stories because we often think about Islam as being one of the conduits of black Palestinian solidarity. And I want to mention how Christianity, too, can be a conduit for the solidarity network. Um, on your left is a man who's now passed away who's Lebanese. He's from Zahle. His name is Joseph Raya. He's a Greek Catholic bishop. Um, and in the 1950s and 60s, he was based in the Jim Crow South in Birmingham. He was the bishop who... Um, desegregated his church, and as a result, KKK kidnapped him and beat him up. He met with Martin Luther King. He attended the Great Mar March on Washington in 1963. And then in the late 60s, the church transferred him to Haifa. And once he was in Palestine, he began making common cause with the Palestinians. He even led a march on the Knesset, which ended with him on top of a jeep and a megaphone, quoting scriptures against Golda Meir, Jezebel, Jezebel, give freedom to my people. So this is like a real link between, uh, with Christianity between the black freedom struggle and the Palestinian struggle. And the fellow on the right is uh, Hader al-Yatim. He's, he's from Beit Sur, I believe, but he's a Lutheran, um, a Lutheran minister in New York. And he actually, um, a few years ago in the United States, when there was this movement to get rid of all these Confederate statues, he was instrumental in getting a plaque to Robert E. Lee removed from a Brooklyn cemetery, which was news to me there was one there. Um, in addition, Palestinians have done things like use the, the civil rights movement and the black freedom movement in their own protests. A few years ago, several Palestinians boarded a bus, a segregated bus in the West Bank with slogans of the civil rights movement. They were arrested, of course, after getting off the next stop. One of the Jewish settlers who was looking on told a reporter, what are these people doing? This is not a Martin Luther King bus. And in Janine, at the Janine Freedom Theater, they've instituted a freedom ride. I had the privilege of attending it in 2015. The Janine Freedom Ride's a 10-day to 14-day excursion through the West Bank. It's maybe 20 or 25 local Palestinian artists, activists, theater performers, and maybe 15 to 20 internationals. And they go to those little small communities and take part in different activities. One of the things we did was uh, go to Nabi Saleh, where um, <clears throat> we uh, took part in the, the weekly protest uh, and talked to the Tamimi family. Um, about the protest. At, at the time, Basim Tamimi, the father, was asked, why do you allow your children to you know, run to the front lines of these demonstrations? And he specifically, he specifically cited the 1963 Children's March in Birmingham, where Martin Luther King, likewise, was criticized for allowing children to take part in the demonstrations. Of course, the, the Tamimis have since become quite family, especially the daughter Ahed. Um, she slapped a soldier, as you know, two years ago and, and was then arrested and spent, I think, eight months in Israeli jail. What's interesting is also the racial discourse that accompanies this family. Um, there were several writers in the United States who attempted to link her to black martyrs, like Trayvon Martin, um, one, one uh, author for Al Jazeera, but black, born in Philadelphia, compared her to Rosa Parks. Um, and she was supposed to, before she got arrested, she was supposed to go on a speaking tour in America with a black feminist liberation theologian. Meanwhile, in Israel, the whiteness was all they could see. And it became known that several years ago, the Knesset actually, um, actually had a secret investigation commissioned to see whether or not this was a real family. They thought they were too white. They thought these were Palestinian actors and they had been chosen because of their looks to appeal to Western sentiments, right? Apparently they're just too white. So, you, you, and then you, I won't, I'll, I'll stop there with, with the Tamimis, but you can see how this family gets locked into transnational racial discourse. While we were there, one of the things that we did in the, the Freedom Theater is there were, there, were, there were performers who did playback theater, 
we'd go to places and they would hear stories from the audience and then perform them, you know, imp imp they'd improv the performances. Um, in one small uh, village that had been torn down a few weeks before, we were sitting there in a makeshift camp, chickens and goats, and people began telling stories about settler oppression. We could see the settlement just a few hundred uh, meters away. And then an African-American woman who was with us told the story of Eric Garner, the Brooklyn, the, the man in Brooklyn who was killed by police saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And it was re-performed right there. So seeing this story of black martyrdom performed in midst of the devastation of Israeli colonialist racist apartheid was, was quite a moving moment. Um, I am going to try to wrap this up really quickly now so we can have some discussion. But I continue to talk about the ways that even in Israel, whiteness is not so guaranteed. There are things like black Jews, um, Jews from Arab lands who did things like start the Israeli Black Panther Party. And the way that even in Israel, which is in many ways a white supremacist country, even internally, whiteness is fractured. Um, so I talk about the African refugees. And then I come back to you know, this idea that Whenever we see Israelis do things like this, and, they, and they, use, they use American social media as their own, this is not just fun and games. This is an appeal to transnational solidarity. It's an appeal to whiteness. And homos becomes white face performance. They're saying, we are white. You should be on our side. And if the Israelis can use culture and media to perform their whiteness, well, Palestinians and, and black Americans can do the opposite and they can perform their own solidarity. Some of the conclusions I reach in this chapter are, are the following. I mean, first I say that black Palestinian solidarity is mutual, mutually beneficial. I mean, it's, this is not a question of one side learning from the other, but there's ways that both sides do learn from each other. Um, if it's a one-sided thing, then it's problematic. Um, second, it escapes geographical limits. It means that if you want to stand in solidarity with, with black Americans or with Palestinians, it doesn't necessarily mean you going to that place. There's things you can do here, there's things you can do there to support each other. For instance, in the United States, what I say is you can support the BDS movement to boycott Israel. You don't have to go to the West Bank to support Palestine. You can support Palestine by taking part in struggles at home. It also demonstrates the instability of race. Um, just because you're black or just because you're Palestinian doesn't necessarily mean your politics are right on. Um, black Palestinian solidarity is not natural. Some black leaders like Bayard Rustin, one of the architects of the 1963 March on Washington was a lifelong Zionist. Even though when it came to America, he was a committed nonviolent activist. When it came to Israel, he was actually writing op-eds in the New York Times requesting the United States to give Israel more weapons. And he compared the PLO to the racist KKK. So just because you're black or Palestinian doesn't necessarily come with attached values. Um, she's now out of the race, alhamdulillah. But Kamala Harris spoke at AIPAC and she said, why is she pro-Israel? Because she learned the lessons of Selma. She learned the lessons of the civil rights movement. O Obama said similar things. So these are people who took the lessons of the civil rights movement, but instead of using it to fight apartheid, they're using it to justify colonialism. And finally, in my main point, it demonstrates fragments of equality that already exist in the midst of our inegalitarian present, which is a long thing equality exists. When we see these protests, it's not just some radical idea about the future. It's, it's, it's showing that there's seeds of that future already amongst us. The black Palestinian solidarity is a window into the freedoms that people in power would rather us not see. Let me end with a really quick story. Um, well, I was at Beer Zeit a few years ago giving a talk about the Black Panther Party, um, and specifically the image of Black Panther Party founder Bob, Bobby Seale as he sat chained to a chair. He was in trial in 1969 in Chicago, and he wanted to defend himself, but the judge wouldn't let him. So every time a witness testified against him, he would speak up, he would stand up to question the witness, and he'd be told, sit down, shut up, you have a lawyer. So eventually, he was put in chains. 1969, United States, black man in chains. Um, I was talking about this image and the way it pervaded culture. Woody, movies by Woody Allen referenced this. There was a time when this was a well-known event, although now it's no longer remembered. And so I'm in Beers 8 talking about this. And afterwards, a young woman comes up to me. She's 20 years old. And she knows everything about black radicalism, third world liberation. She's read Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, all of them. And speaking to her, I realized I should have just sat down and let her give the lecture in my place. 
about a about a week later, I'm in Amman and I'm checking my uh, email and news at an internet cafe, and I see a news article that two Palestinian translators had accompanied the international journalists at a protest in the West Bank. And when they were leaving, the Israeli soldiers detained them, accused them of throwing stones. And I recognized the name. It was that girl who had spoken to me, that young woman who had spoken to me at Birzeh. A few days later, she appeared in court, shackled to her chair, wearing the same clothes she had been wearing when she was apprehended. And I realized, you know, I can talk about this image and it's in the past and it, it, there's some historical distance. But for her, this was not just some random story. I mean, it was a reality, a reality that took place after I met her. Let's fast forward a few months back to the summer 2014 where we began. Gaza's on, in ashes and people in Ferguson are demonstrating uh, against white supremacy. And when I looked at Twitter and I saw all the different names of Palestinians tweeting their support, giving directions about how to deal with pepper spray and tear gas, I recognized the name, Miriam Barvoti, the same young woman I met at Birzeit, the same young woman who was put in chains in a kangaroo court, just like Black Panther Party Bobby Seale before her, was tweeting her support for the, for the people in Ferguson, Missouri, fighting white supremacy there. And in so doing, she was not just, not just uh, thinking about you know, black Palestinian solidarity, I mean, she was demonstrating it and demonstrating the equality that already exists. Thank you very much. I got done one minute later than I said I would, so that's good. I'm happy to take your questions. I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Yes, I see a, I see a hand. Hi, Greg. Um, thank you for the lecture. It's just very interesting. And, and uh, I have uh, one comment and one sure. question. Why, why didn't you start your lecture with the identity chapter? Because, why did I? Um, identity chapter, because I think as a Palestinian, um, identity is more important than uh, to talk about the identity in front of us. You are talking about our identity um, in front of us so we can criticize you because all your arguments in the next chapter is based on this thing. Hmm. Uh, so uh, I, I would love to hear something about um, how you, do you formulate uh, our identity um, from your perspective as a cultural theory professor. Okay. Um, the, the second uh, argument, which I, I disagree with you, that we are equal. We are not. Um, and, and I'm speaking as someone from Gaza. I, I, uh, we have no equality at all, what, and, and what I see is we are homo sacer, or we are in a bare life, in, in, let's put it in the, in, in, in the uh, theory of Giorgio Agamben. Yeah. So that's what I think, we, uh, we have no life. We, yeah. we, we have been dehumanized to the level of non-existence, bare life. Or if you want to advance it to more, um, something more left, you can use Alexander Wahalia uh, of the Habeas Viscos. So that's what we are. There is no equality. And to put this as a first um, argument and base your whole book on that we, we are equal, I, I think in somehow you, 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 I, I would understand as you miss um, the, the, the whole point of, of it. We, yeah. we don't have uh, equality at all. At all level, not social, not borders, the travel, not that. What I love about the thing in your book is the hello time. And I, I, I totally agree, and I think this is some fantastic work to use how Israel is abusing and exploiting and colonizing our time, not only um, in, in terms of, 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 of culture and culture theory, but also in real time, the travels, the borders, the the procedures, um, um, the studies, the uh, to prevent us and deprive us from meeting our beloved ones and so on. So that that's what I'm. So thank you very much. Shall I answer one by one or take a few? I'll answer one by one. First of all, I'm so happy to have an antagonistic question, but couched in a very friendly way. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I don't. I, I'm not a fan of a gambin uh, social death. Homo soccer. I mean, when you say that equality doesn't exist, first of all, I'm not at all saying Palestinians have equality under the law. 
whether it's Israeli law or international law. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that slaves on a ship being sent across at the Atlantic several hundred years ago were equal to the white people with the whips on top, on the deck. What I'm saying is there was a supposition made of equality. People didn't just naturally say, yes, fine, we're not equal, we're going to be slaves. Yes, fine, we're not equal, we're going to live in our ghettos. Yes, fine, you say you're better than me, I'm just going to accept apartheid. There's a supposition made, no, I'm not going to accept it. I am equal, and these people can go to hell, and I'm going to fight them, right? And so that's that supposition of equality that I'm, that I'm referring to. I'm, I'm not saying that life is peachy in any sense, but I'm trying to say that there is something radical taking place when people fight it. And what's interesting about what I'm trying to do here, and you're free to disagree with me, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is when you, when you take equality as a starting point, suddenly you radically undercut Zionism. We often think about Zionism as this thing that came and Palestinians are reacting to it. And I think it's the opposite. There was something equal, something radical, and something liberatory about Palestine before any Zionist ever reached Levantine shores. And that's why Zionism continues to develop methods of trying to control the Palestinians, walls, surveillance cameras, weapons. It's because it cannot destroy and it cannot remove something that already existed so when you take equality as a starting point, as I do, I'm not saying life is peachy, but what I'm saying is that Zionism cannot deal with Palestinian equality, and that's why it's trying so hard to destroy it at every turn. So that's, that's my argument, which you're free to disagree with, but that's what, I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to say. And now in terms of why did I start the way I did, you're free to read the chapters in a different order. They don't have to necessarily go in that order. Um, so, yeah. Um, what I do say, just to give you a preview about identity is, Again, the, oftentimes when people talk about Palestinian identity, there's a couple of different schools of thought. One is people, especially more like Zionists, but actually not even Zionists. Like they say things like, you know, Palestinian identity is largely a reaction to Zionism. And even though Palestinians wouldn't want to admit that, whenever people base the identity in Nakba, there's a way in which Zionism precedes Palestinian identity. identity. Like Zionism committed these tragedies and Palestinian identity comes out of that. And that's only partially true. Obviously, Palestinian identity is forged through the oppressions of Zionism, but that's not it. There's something that predates Zionism. So I call the first one like the forces of the Nakba, the second one the forces of Intifada. But then this idea that Palestinian identity is never finished, that it's, it's a continuing project, that, that first of all, there's no one thing, it's Palestinian identity, but also that it's never complete. Um, so that's, that's what I talk about in that chapter. I don't talk about that a lot with Palestinians because I feel pretty presumptuous talking about Palestinian identity to Palestinians. Um, again, I would, I would say, as I said at the beginning, you know, when I wrote this book, I, I didn't think about Palestinians being my primary audience. Um, I, I think Palestinians could enjoy this book, maybe agree with it, maybe disagree with it, but I was trying to, in some way, fight English academia and cultural people who don't take Palestine seriously and try to put Palestine on the map with them. That's what I was thinking. So thank you for the question. I, I may not have convinced you, but thank you for the question. Um, hi, I'd like to ask a sort of two-part question um, concerning the UK. Um, in December last year, uh, it was sort of brought to light that um, the new Conservative government was planning to uh, make participation and support of the BDS movement in the UK um, something illegal. Um, and also, uh, very recently, in the um, reworking of the Brexit bill, um, under Boris Johnson, there's an idea coming out that uh, refugee children are going to be denied the right, in the UK, are going to be denied the right to um, being reunited with their families. Do you have, what, what kind of thoughts do you have about that? What do I have? I'm sorry, my ideas about British laws? Pro probably um, more uh, focused on the, the idea of making the um, support um, of the BDS movement illegal in the UK. What do yeah. you think about this? Well, I mean, I don't know a lot of specifics about uh, the UK, um, apart from the slandering of Corbyn. Um, I know that similar dynamics are taking place in the, in the US at the state level, but also at the federal level. Um, I think. I mean, all I can say, all I would say about that is it proves BDS's effectiveness. Um, if it wasn't effective, people wouldn't be fighting it so well. Um, I 
greatly support it, and um, it's it's a it's a step in the right direction. I don't have much more to say about this. No. Sorry. Um, I have one question and two things that I just wanted to add for the Ahad Tamimi case. I believe also her mother made a statement saying that the reason why her daughter has become so famous is because she's pretty, like by like heteronormative standards of beauty, and also that she looks white, which is an interesting kind of like introspection that the family is aware of like the power that they yeah. have based on how they look. You know, she's a young girl. You know, she's not male. Her brother and her cousins have all been arrested as well, which is why she had originally slapped the soldier. Um, I think her cousin had been detained. And then secondly, in kind of looking at the racialization of, I guess, like Palestinian bodies, um, in 2015, there was a case in Beersheba where um, a Palestinian had uh, attacked, uh, I think, a transit station and had sh shot and killed a lot of um, uh, the Jewish Israelis. But uh, an Eritrean asylum seeker was mistakenly identified as like a second shooter and a mob actually beat him to death, thinking mm. that he was Palestinian, basically because of how he looked. So that kind of like mixing of like othering of different races was an interesting case. Um, and obviously, you know, afterwards, the Israeli court said that they were looking for who had, you know, beaten him and whether it was a soldier who had shot him or uh, like the mob that had beaten him to death. I think one thing that came up, and maybe you go into it more in your book, is how you look at the difference between like things that go viral on social media and then like traditional film um, and film and photography, just how like some of the, the viral cases that you've looked at and like the YouTube videos, how you differentiate between like Palestinian film, such as, you know, Paradise Now, but how, you know, those go through very different processes. You know, one is vetted and ideally funded. One can be kind of very spontaneous um, and not, mm. you know, doesn't need external or even internal funding. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, let me start with the first point. Um, I believe there's two lynchings like that. I know of the one you speak of. The other thing that happened, especially there's, there's some wild violence in Israel taking place in 2012, 2014 internally. Uh, there's this rash of homophobic attacks, um, especially against the African asylum seekers. But another thing that happened is there were all these uh, attacks on Arab Jews. Like uh, some Zionist would want to attack a Palestinian, so they saw an Arab and, and attacked them. And actually, there was a Jew who is from the Arab world, and there was like this mistaken identity, um, which is which is quite fascinating. Actually, the fact that they couldn't tell the difference. I want to go back, since you mentioned it, to th this picture here. When the African asylum seekers, um, there's about seventy thousand of them now. It's about thirty thousand people from Eritrea, Sudan. Um, with all these attacks against them, some of the Israeli leaders who've led the attacks are actually Arab Jews. Um, Miri Regev's father, the person on the left here, her father, she's now the cultural minister. Her father is uh, Moroccan. And Elia Shai, he was the interior minister. He's Tunisian. And they, sh she called the Africans a cancer. And, you know, in, especially in Jewish dis discourse, this is highly charged. This is like Nazi terminology. So people asked her to, to um, you know, apologize, and she did. I, she apologized, but she didn't apologize to the African asylum seekers. She apologized to the Israeli cancer survivors. She was sorry for comparing them to black Africans. And then Ilya Shai said, this country belongs to us, and I quote, the white man. This country belongs to us, to the white man, and I'll do everything I can to remove the infiltrators. They're using the word infiltrator, mistanim or something in Hebrew. It's the same word that Israelis use against Palestinians after the Nakba when Palestinians try to return to their homes. So this discourse about related to Palestinians is now being placed on the African asylum seeker. And so, um, yeah, there's so many different avenues for looking at the white supremacist racial hierarchy within Israel and um, the African asylum seekers are one of them that I'm quite interested in. And your second thing you spoke about was, um, what was your second? Oh, the Tamimis. Media. Okay, so you know a lot of media scholars take the, those questions very seriously. They're very specific. Why are you talking about film and not television? If you're talking about television, what's specific about it? How is that different than social media? I'm not one of those people. I take all the media forms I can, and I'm happy to do so. I'm happy to mix media and look, you know, opportunistically on my part, whatever media happens to, you know, fit into my argument. So it's not something I address quite a bit. I mean, it's obviously true. Making a film is a difficult project, especially 
if you're a refugee living in the West Bank, how are you gonna make a film? How are you gonna get the money? Who's gonna give you the money? And what streams are gonna be attached with that money? So, I mean, I, I do talk about film financing, um, but it's not one of the main discussions in my book is like understanding how these different media forms travel and circulate differently. Hey, Craig. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Um, my question is related to um, the black Palestinian solidarity. Yes. So um, despite the long and obviously very important history um, of the solidarity between them and that continues today. My question is how, I mean, it's not really, I mean, it has a lot of, you know, with the, the images that you've shown us and everything and all the books that have been written about it, you would think um, that it's almost a mainstream uh, kind of idea, but I would argue that it's not exactly mainstream. Maybe it's, it's known about a lot in, in certain circles, but um, on the ground in the US, um, would you say that, that, I mean, am I right, that it's not exactly mainstream? And if, if so, how, what, what are the steps, you know, because through, is it through media, is it through books, is it through social media, what, what kind of media? I mean, I would argue and guess that it's not through films or books that, that your average American, but especially in this case, black American, is going to find out about Palestine and the joint struggles between the two uh, the two peoples, or maybe yes, I don't know. This no, is, I mean, this is even in that question. chapter, I don't even talk about film. It's more about music, YouTube videos, okay. new spectacles. But sorry, I'll let you finish your question. But I mean, yeah, and, and, and specifically this year, you know, look, heading towards an election, for example, I mean, how, yeah. how is it that, um, that the candidates that are, I'm not even going to say more pro-Palestine, maybe less Zionist, can reach out to these communities and use the, the idea of this, of, of um, this joint struggle of, or mm -hmm. solidarity to to persuade um, the black you know, black community to vote for them. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking Sanders in particular, but um, but yeah, I mean, how ca how can it basically cross the threshold between it being like a fringe movement of solidarity to something that becomes very mainstream? That that if you were to ask your average again American, but specifically black American, oh, do you know about Palestine? That the first thing they think of is the joint struggle of solidarity and not uh, Hamas or terrorism or, you know, the usual stuff that you would hear on the news. Okay, so the first thing I would say, is it mainstream? I would say nothing beautiful in this world is mainstream. So uh, it's probably not the majority position, but it depends on which black community you're talking about. Are we talking about rural Kentucky? Or are we talking about inner city Harlem? Are we talking about Christian? Or are we talking about Muslim blacks? So the, are we talking about young or old? So all that really changes. This is true even in the 60s. Like, Keep in mind, in 1967, pro-Israel fillings in America were at a high. It was one of the moments at its high. After this uh, 1967 war, when Israel retook or took Jerusalem, took the West Bank, took Gaza, and, and further, Sinai Peninsula and Golan, uh, at that time, um, there was a huge Zionist feeling in, in the United States. And it was precisely at that time that one of the primary civil rights organizations, black power organizations, SNCC, published um, a newsletter condemning Zionism and demonstrating solidarity with, with black people. And as a result, there was a huge skirmish within civil rights organizations. A lot of the Jewish benefactors, the more mainstream benefactors, cut off their funding. A similar thing happened with Black Lives, Move, black Lives Matter. 2016, Black Lives Matter um, released a policy proposal several pages long, and it included support for uh, BDS. And so you have a similar thing taking place here among um, you know, more liberal, let's say, um, black activists, and then the more radical ones. Now, what's so important, from my view, about the solidarity of, for, for, for the black community is there's this tendency, if, if, you, if you take Palestine out of the picture and you just become like a civil rights-only organization, then you become blind to the ways that the United States is an imperialist power. And so keeping the Palestinians in mind is a way to broaden our critique, not just of U.S. internal domestic issues, but of U.S. as an imperialist nation. Um, it's one of the benefits of it. How does that translate to the mainstream? I mean, I wish I had a recipe book for you, but this is the question that we are all facing. How do, if, if anything beautiful in this world is not mainstream, as I said, how does it ever become, you know, how does it ever take over? Um, I would say through Black Lives Matter, specifically Bernie Sanders, you see certain people who he has surrounded himself with who come out of Black Lives Matter. And you have seen his rhetoric on Palestine shift tremendously 
even in the last four years, um, he still talks about two-state solution. He still says, I love Israel, but we should also protect the Palestinians. So I'm not sitting here telling you he's like, yes, or Arafat. What I'm trying to say, or Ghassan Kanafani, let's say. But, but he did say something the other day that, you know, the United States should take its funding for Israel and give some of it to Gaza. That might just be the big, that might still be a small step in the right direction. But for a U.S. politician to say that, and a Jewish one at that, I never thought I'd live to see the day. And I think his association with people like Black Lives Matter certainly has something to do with that. His association with people like Rashida Tlaib, with Ilhan Omar, certainly has something to do with that. Any further questions or comments or flames? Yes. Oh, so where can you buy my book? Um, it's available at Antoine's. I apologize. I think it's about $30. I don't see any of that, so I'm sorry. I'd give it to you cheaper if I could. But, um, but it's at the Hamra branch of Antoine's and the Beirut Souks branch of Antoine's. Or you can ask any Antoine's. I'm sure they could transfer it over. So Antoine's has it. Yes. Precise methodology and how did you handle your own uh, identity, you know, uh, while working about this Palestinian and blackness, you know, whiteness? Uh, how did you manage with your own identity? How are you received? Did you do, did you do like, I mean, like, oh, okay. I mean, as a researcher, I mean, I mean did you do a proper grand research? Is it only theoretical? No, it's um, what. And how was it received as well, like, you know, no, in the different spheres in which you went? And yeah, I am no ethnographer. I'm no anthropologist. And I'm very happy I'm not. <laughs> I'm much more theoretical. I'm a cultural theorist in the, in, the, in the guise of Stuart Hall or Judith Butler. I mean, these are the kind of people whose work I really love. For that matter, Edward Said. I attended a lot of film festivals. I interviewed Anne-Marie Jasser. I interviewed different directors. Um, I attended a few different protests. Um, I attended the uh, Janine Freedom Theater. I talked to people. You know, I always feel an incredible burden as um, because of who I am. I have to like prove my politics to talk to people, and and I, I, you know, so I mean, how am I received? For the most part, people are just excited that that happy that somebody else is you know interested in the struggle and interested in fighting it in some way. So I didn't have you know like hostile reception in terms of that. In terms of my own family, that's a different story. But they all boycotted my book talk, so <laughs> it's a different kind of BDF. Um, I don't know. Um, in terms of methodology, and that, I mean, I explained at the very beginning my theoretical assumptions, my theoretical way of looking at things. So and, some, like, some political assumption on me, and like, so you use. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I, I don't think it's as simple as saying like you. Uh, both of these are incorrect. It's not like I have a theoretical assumption and then I plug in the holes by looking at empiric empirical data. But the opposite is also false which is something a lot of the ethnographers, ethnographers don't understand. You can interview people, you can talk to people, and then you get your theoretical. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way either. Both ways inform each other. I, I don't think we have like empirical details that give us our theory. I don't, we have, I don't think we should have theory that informs our, our little details. I think they put them in some kind of dialectical tension. Um, I, I, I always hate the methodology questions as a cultural person, not a sociologist or anthropologist. Um, but... Uh, yeah, as I described at the beginning is, is how I approached it. And you know, I don't even see my book. I, I guess it is an academic book. It's published by an academic press. Most of my talks are at universities, but I don't see it as an academic book. Like, I don't think it reads like an academic book. God, I hope it doesn't. If it reads like an academic book, I wouldn't want to read it either. So I'm hoping that my book is useful to people outside of academia. Um, and I hope it is interesting to people who aren't spending their days in university libraries. Inshallah. Um, I do have a question. Sure. It, it might be a bit uh, off topic. So when the uh, 2014 war in Gaza happened and when uh, Soha Arraf presented her film uh, Villa Tuma in, in Venice and submitted it as a, as a Palestinian film, although it received uh, funding from the Israeli Film Fund, I want to know, what, what do you think about that? So I talk about this book. I believe the gentleman who asked the first question already left. He asked me about identity. Oh, he's still here. He moved away. <laughs> so I, I, I talk specifically about this film in the question about identity because she's a Palestinian, but she's got Israeli citizenship. She's a 48 Palestinian. 
And she has worked on some Israeli productions with Jewish directors in the past. So she finally makes her first film. She applies for Israeli funds to make the film. Her perspective, as somebody who lives there, her perspective was, these are my tax dollars. I want them back. And I want to use them to make a Palestinian film. Now, we can argue whether we agree with her or not, but that's her rationale. She makes the film. And it's actually a really good film. I'm, I'm a big fan of it, although nobody watches it. Israelis don't watch it because it's Palestinian. Palestinians don't watch it because it's Israeli funded. So nobody watches this movie. Um, the problem is, when she went to the film festivals, she declared it to be a Palestinian film. And the Israeli government went crazy. They publicly denounced her. They threatened to take all of her money back. And so her solution was actually an intriguing one. She refused to call it Israeli, but she accepted not to call it Palestinian. So it became a stateless film. And what could be more Palestinian than that? And so at all the subsequent film festivals, a stateless film. At the time this happened, I was living in California, and there's a Santa Barbara Film Festival there. And it was coming. I was really excited. And I looked on the online program, and it said Israel. And so I found her on Facebook and sent her a message. I was like, do you know your film is Israeli at the California Film Festival? And she sent me back a message, thank you for telling me. And two days later, I looked, and it was stateless. She, she took care of it. So I appreciate that. But you know, these, these kinds of situations are, are you know, for people who can't access film funds, and you know, like her, she wants to do it, but I understand it's controversial. But keep in mind, some of the directors we know the best, Elias Suleiman, Hani Abu Assad, they took Israeli film funds at one point, before the BDS movement was a thing. But they did, and they got their reputations as a result. So it's a, it's a bind that some of these, some of these directors are in. Um, so yeah, she took funds. As a result, nobody watches her movies. But if you find a black market copy, I suggest you watch it. It's a really good movie. I've just seen interviews with her in which she said, when, in which she said precisely, um, you know, a lot of the people who have Israeli citizenship, I'm talking both to Jews I've spoken to who are anti-Zionist and to Palestinians. Their, their response is, internationally, I support BDS, but I live here. Every time I buy a toothbrush, I break BDS. And so their position is, I'm, a, I'm living here. These are my tax dollars. I want to use them to do good things. We are positioned outside of the country. We can question whether we, we agree with them or not. But that is what I've heard from some people on the ground there. They support it internationally, but they see themselves you know, living in Nazareth, living in Jaffa. They find it a bit more difficult to see how do you, if you're living there, how do you comply with it and what, what do you do? So that's, that's the story I've gotten from several different people, whether we like it or not. Right. I mean, even in the West Bank, like, in, like you go to a store in, in the West Bank and they're, gonna ha they're not going to have Israeli products unless, I don't know, it's like a medicine, something they, they can't easily get elsewhere. And in which case, they make an exception and they'll have the Israeli product. I mean, they use Israeli currency. So you know, there's a lot of contradictions. Right. Well, like I said, the idea is even some places I've been, the only stuff they sold was the stuff that they had a difficult time finding other replacement. It's, they're, under, they're under colonization. Their relationships to BDS should be different than ours or with people in the West. This final question about the role of international NGOs, especially European Commission and European Union funded the projects because in the last five years, um, if you want to, um, and, and I have very close friends in Gaza and the West Bank, if you want to do a film or a movie or something media, you have to avoid talking about identity or yeah. about something political. So you, ha so, if it, so you have to go to, to talk about um, how, to grow, to, how to cut hair or how to grow or to do falafel or some entrepreneurship. At the same time, the same project like which I follow the EU in Israel and EU in, uh, in Israel uh, between parentheses, yeah, um, and, and EU in Palestine. Um, for example, they teach Israeli kids to artificial intelligence, media production, film production. At the same time, at the same period, they fund Palestinian children how to clean the streets and how to clean the walls. Um, um, how do you see this uh, through um, uh, culture purpose uh, lenses? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is, as you said, 
funding often comes with strings attached. I mean, a, a, a very relevant example is, is Netflix. And from what I understand, they're developing a lot of shows, but people who have approached them to do, you know, Arabic language, anything that seems political in their eyes has not been given the green light. And so instead we're stuck with some of the stuff you've seen. I think most people hated Jen. I didn't see it, but um, yeah, this is, the, the the problem of getting funding and then the strings attached and what's acceptable, what's not. And that's not even that's not even only a Palestinian problem. I mean, look at Lebanese productions. Look at how look at the films like Labaki's film, Kapernaum, and you know, who's funding it and what audience is she really playing to? I would say it's not this audience, I'd say it's a French audience or a, an American audience. And that kind of thing would get funded, whereas something relevant to the not just relevant to Palestine, but relevant to the Palestinian liberation struggle against colonialism would, would never get would never get greenlit by a, um, a major US or European organization. I would also say that what you say with respect to educating different races, different classes, different peoples into becoming janitors or into becoming cultural workers, you know, that, actually, that in some ways that resembles very much the United States where certain school districts are already getting people ready, to be honest, for the prison. The schools resemble a prison Going to school is learning to be a prisoner if you're black because that's where you will go. So there's some similarities there. Um, so it's clear that there is a divide. Um, we've seen Palestinian cinema enter the world stage and it has traveled, but we haven't seen it really break into the mainstream. If you look at things like the Oscars or any other mainstream Western mm. platforms, and I'm wondering what needs to happen in order for that to take place, in order for it to be an equal playing field, because it's not. I don't know, downfall of Western imperialism and Israeli colonialism. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you do see small things here and there. So the, what was the first Palestinian film nominated for an Oscar? Well, it was divine intervention, but why? It was entered a year late. They approached the Academy wanting to nominate it, and the Academy said, no, we don't accept Palestine as a state. Therefore, we can't accept it as an as a Oscar nominee. There was a bit of uproar about it, so they relinquished their, their stand and accepted it the next year, although it wasn't a finalist. But eventually, the first finalist was uh, Paradise Now, and they didn't recall it Palestine. They called it Palestinian territories. They refused to call it Palestine. And it was erasing it in a way. It's, sorry, it's, yeah. it's, it's an erasure. It's, it's a denial of Palestine as a state. Um, um, that was done with Israeli pressure as well. And then finally, it was either Five Broken Cameras, the documentary, or Omar, I'm not sure which, was finally called Palestine. So it took a long time. And you're seeing small things. Oh, the, the other thing to keep in mind about the American market, the, if we're talking about America, is Americans are quite hostile to others, right? It's, it's not only Palestine, it's, it's just anybody who's not speaking English has a very difficult time in the American market. It's different than the European market. Um, I mean, just now there's a South Korean film called Parasite that's been nominated for Oscars and it's barely getting a US release. So it's very difficult for, the, for things to become, like for a Palestinian film to be big in the United States, already from just a phobia against the foreign, but then from a political standpoint. Europe's a little bit different. Every time I go to France, there's, a, there's usually like a, a Palestinian or Palestinian-related film being released, and I see posters for it. So it's a bit different. Isn't it a bit problematic if we think about the fact that this is where the most visibility is and nothing that's ever beautiful is in the yeah. mainstream, then it's, what do we do? It's a long fight. It's, it's, a, it's, a, long, it's, a, it's a long fight. Um, and I, I think all we can do or, is see the small victories that are accumulating but without ignoring the major defeats that are also continuing. So, you know, even, even as an academic, you know, I mean, when, yet, when Edward Said was writing about Palestine in the 60s and 70s, nobody wrote about Palestine that way. Nobody. Him and Ibrahim Abulago, that was it. Everybody else, you couldn't say it. You couldn't say those things. So it's easy for me now to sit pretty and say, hey, I can write about Palestine all I want, but it's not true. My colleague Stephen Salida lost his job here and there. So even though on the one hand there is more freedom for me, on the other hand there's still major defeats and maybe I'll hit a landmine one day. So 
I don't know. On the one hand, we have these victories, but on the other hand, we have these major defeats taking place simultaneously. It's, it's very difficult, both at the academic level and the cultural level. Thanks. We good? Well, let me just say all of you, thank you so much. Um, I've presented this to a few audiences in the United States. It's, it's really nice to present it here at Darrell Newman. And um, thank you for your time and your questions. And uh, feel free to come say hey to me at AUB sometime. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>